Our next speaker to the stage is something unusual among Stoics. You might think, although perhaps I think less unusual than you may assume, we have a musical Stoic, I believe, Sharon Lowell, who is a philosophical writer, a musician based in Northern California. She's the author of The Art of Living, the classical manual on virtue, happiness, and effectiveness, a very popular book that I think has been read by many people. Have you got a copy with you? Right. And her talk is entitled Living the Best Possible Life, Epictetus's Recipe or Prescription for Clarity, Ease, and Serenity. Sharon LaBelle. I'm so happy to be here. This is my favorite city in my favorite country. And, well, I should say, I, I wrote this book, it's, it's almost been two decades since it was published. And being here with you, I, I feel like uh, for two decades I've been wandering in the wilderness and now I've found my tribe, so. <laughs> <laughs> When I wrote this book, The Art of Living, which I should say, um, it's an interpretation of Epictetus's moral teachings. And I'm the person that scholars love to hate because I'm a popularizer. But I think it's very, very important in order to reach out to regular people to present important ideas that can really make a difference in our lives in an accessible way. Because then that becomes an invitation to go deeper, to read the primary sources. So hooray for popularizers. <laughs> when I wrote The Art of Living, I didn't know anyone in my world who was interested in Stoicism, much less Epictetus. I didn't even know anyone who could pronounce his name. <laughs> but I cared a lot about what he had to say because in a very real way, Epictetus saved my life. I have since learned with humility and gratitude that Epictetus's key ideas expressed in an accessible language have literally saved other people's lives, literally. Over years, I've received letters from people from every walk of life, but especially from people who have traverse dire circumstances that exceed anything that I could ever imagine or bear up under. Because what is Epictetus's stoicism but adversity management? Adversity that spans the prosaic challenges of everyday life as well as the acute life-threatening troubles, adversity, that are borne by soldiers in the throes of war. I've received, I've humbly received many letters from soldiers who served in Iraq and Afghanistan who somehow came upon Epictetus' teachings in this book and they were pulled back from the brink of despair and even suicide. So what is it that's so compelling about Epictetus's prescriptions for the best possible life, the flourishing life? 
Even before I began to understand some of Epictetus' teachings, his themes and values were very attractive to me. His emphasis on discernment, morality, and character building. I had never felt in tune with the summer of love generation, even though they really are my cohort. That mentality seemed too vapidly thrill-seeking, narcissistic, and feelings-driven. Epictetus drew me in because he offered an unapologetic moral teaching, refreshingly free of sanctimony and dogmatism. So, before we get into the body of this talk, I want to change my glasses because I'm not seeing that well. And I want to pull back for a second and address what I consider to be the most crucial question that is embedded in Epictetus' teachings. Here it is. What can you do with a moment? What can you do with a moment? Well, there's a lot you can do with a moment. You can reach out and hug somebody. You can apologize. You can pull the gun's trigger. You can put that drink down and have it be your last. You can make the difficult phone call. Well, you fill in the blank. And the other thing we can do with a moment is waste it by underestimating its power to change everything. Everything. The moral spirit of Epictetus' teachings is always concerned with the decisional instant. This is our point of power. It is the locus of the only power we have. For all said and done, Epictetus would ask us, over what do we have control? Where does your sovereignty lie? Certainly not on what he calls externals, other people's opinions, physical laws, the temperature outside, what have you. We're sovereign over one thing only, and that is what we think, say, or do with this moment right here, or what we refrain from thinking, saying, or doing with this moment right here. And that's powerful because everything, and I mean everything, emanates from this moment radiating out into the future. Well, we all know that Epictetus' Stoicism is a therapeutic tradition. His teachings are meant to be corrective medicine for disaffected or lost souls. In other words, all of us. And I want to describe three kind of randomly chosen modern soul afflictions that are part of the human condition and Epictetus' prescriptions or tonics for these diseases. The first, common malaise, for which Epictetus offers us a tonic, is our distorted thinking, which causes us to mistakenly try to control or manage what Epictetus would call externals and the consequent suffering we heap on others from our vain efforts to do so. Epictetus, as well as our other esteemed Stoics, tutor us in a deep acceptance of what really is. 
the isness of any given situation. Not lazy acquiescence, but an acceptance of re reality so radical that it can only give rise to what I call big gratitude. Big gratitude. So here's a story about big gratitude. It isn't always easy to accept the way things really are. And it isn't easy, most of the time, to really feel gratitude. Perhaps someone has said to you, hey, it's all good. It is not all good. I just came from the fires in Northern California. It's not all good. It was not all good when one of my kids came home in the middle of college with sorrowful eyes and an eating disorder. It was not all good when my husband lost his firstborn son or when his former wife, my dear friend Tina, discovered she had breast cancer and died very soon after, leaving two young children or when my husband, Terry, and I lost our own baby. It was not all good when I was living on tortillas, peanut butter, and spare change scavenged in between couch cushions after falling from being the Ivy League wunderkind into abject squalor, lying in fetal position, felled by depression, and addiction. It is indeed not all good, but as Epictetus would remind us, it's not all bad either. To encapsulate the human condition, I have a little private expression. Many meanings all happening at once. Many meanings all happening at once. Each moment, our senses imbibe a riot of information while our minds clamor with observations, insights, emotions, memories, ideas, and the fur uh, further ramifying connections they spawn. Love and pain, joy and sorrow, wonder and devastation, so very many meanings all happening at once. Last summer, my daughter Misha got married. The bucolic scene from her waterside ceremony was breathtaking. The food smelled great. Misha was a radiant bride, and she was marrying a man who cherishes her. The past year had brought an embarrassment of riches for me, my husband Terry, and our six children, their spouses and partners, and our four precious grandchildren. We have so much on the face of it to be grateful for. And yet, acceptance and simple gratitude were not what this mother of the bride was feeling, but rather an unsettled, confused hodgepodge of joy, pride, grief over the recent tragic death of a much too young friend, tenderness, despair over the world's violent chaos, optimism inspired by the capable, idealistic young adults and in, in attendance. As my daughter said, I do, I held the fragility of everything, along with an unsought, inexpressible, mighty thankfulness. I was overcome by confusing pathos and, thanks to Epictetus, gratitude 
for the all of it, the all of it. The past losses and mistakes we thought would freeze and define the rest of our lives, but they didn't. The wrongs that await writing, the unexpected altruisms, the stranger's smile, the teardrop. Aren't we all holding our many meanings all happening at once? Aren't you? Is it possible to feel true acceptance and gratitude without qualification? I think our Stoics would tell us we don't need to worry about that. I believe Epictetus would urge us to climb up a rung on the gratitude hierarchy to a gratefulness more encompassing, whose embrace is wider than I'm grateful for X or I'm so grateful that Y did not happen. Norman Lear, the legendary television producer, published his memoir, I don't know, like a year ago, something like that. And he recounts 93 years of lucky breaks, triumphs, and the chance he had to introduce crucial questions of social justice into North American public conversation through his transient sitcoms. He also described titanic failures, financial reversals, and withering mental illness. However, when Mr. Lear considers each of his life events, here's what this unwitting stoic says. Even this I get to experience. Even this I get to experience. This is big gratitude that stems from Epictetus's teaching that our acceptance of life as it really is with its attendant gratefulness that transcends personal or proximate circumstance and affirms that life itself with all its undisclosed great meanings has absolute value. Epictetus teaches us that we can be grateful simply for our chance to play our part in the human story and to honor with dignity the incomprehensible great mystery we inhabit together. Because life is miraculous. I mean, here we are together, this motley group of stoicism enthusiasts with our private joys, our anxieties, our sorrows, our regrets, our hopes, our fears, our losses and aspirations. Here we are together with all our many meanings all happening at once and even this we get to experience. Okay. Our next ailment of the soul is disordered, self-defended thinking. I think of this malady as the disease of irony. And the antidote for this disease is self-scrutiny applied with kindness. Another short personal story I trust you can relate to. A couple years ago, I had an extraordinary experience in an ordinary place. I flew with one of my daughters to what was, for me, a pretty exotic place, a dinky one-horse town in the middle of the middle of the Midwest. I was handing my daughter off to her freshman year of college at a small liberal arts school. And it was in this little town in Iowa that I learned one of Epictetus's most important lessons about thinking straight and seeking to organize our thoughts, words, and deeds towards arete, virtue, 
in service of eudaimonia, a flourishing life. The thing I noticed about the people in this small Iowa town was that they were absolutely not cool. <laughs> and they didn't care that they weren't cool, which actually, in my book, makes them really cool. <laughs> but that's another conversation. This itty bitty town was extraordinary because it was an irony free zone. Notwithstanding the cosmopolitan character of my daughter's brainy small college, these people I met in Iowa were refreshingly plain spoken. No glibness, no guile, no calculated casualness, no irony, zip, zilch. Now, of course, the irony of, excuse me, the irony of which I speak is not the literary device, but the attitude that toxic posture towards life where human interaction and conversation are carried out, giving sincerity and earnestness no breathing room. Wit must be acerbic, observation must be mordant, otherwise simple meanings must be wrapped in a ponderous insulation of impatient, righteously indignant, though not necessarily informed, aspirational sophistication. Irony favors cleverness over kindness. Can you hear Epictetus scolding us right here? Irony is behavior and speech that convey meanings opposite to their power signifying literal meanings. Irony animates messages that project foregrounded ostensible meanings, erecting a screen in front of and granting immunity to other unavowed, often mean-spirited, actual meanings. It's not saying outright what you mean nor taking responsibility for it. And a lot of us were weaned on this stuff. I remember the conversations I had living among uber-educated urban East Coast amused cynics. And the conversations went like this. Clever utterance, touche. Repost, touche. Counter repost, touche. Repeat as necessary. The structure of these exchanges is a perfect example of mismeeting, a term Martin Buber coined to describe a meeting, excuse me, a meeting with another person that tragically could have been an authentic encounter, but instead devolves into mere transaction. I use you, you use me, bye for now, see you next time. Irony is so corrosive to the moral environment we inhabit. And how easily we ratify it through our speech and action. Epictetus would counsel us that irony is the currency of the arrogantly ignorant. Complacency is its game. Because irony is infatuated with its barbed criticisms of everything it fails to offer, any solutions to the imperfections and problems it gleefully hints at. It is defeatism, cheap thrill, and dead end. Reveling in everything being all messed up and there's nothing we can do about it. It disguises itself as light social lubricant. Hey, can't you take a joke? while ignoring actual human suffering, or derisively chuckling at the absurd and comic, rather than caring for the pitiable, or having a go at the fixable. Epictetus would say irony is the lazy go-to stance of the coward. It crouches behind a hail fellow well-met bush, lest it be caught in a moment of vulnerable sincerity. sincerity. 
and it's a deadly roadblock to the flourishing life. It's a poison deployed to hurt others before they hurt us. It's a boring switch with two settings, defense or offense. And irony's number one job is to negate the significance of this moment. This moment. It militates against caring and sucker punches honest conviction. It bullies the innocent who ventures a simple question. Irony regards our lives and our hopes as a pathetic, trivial joke. It corrodes the soul, pollutes the spiritual ecology by undermining trust in others and in ourselves. It's the monstrous expression of our failed attempt at burying our fears and self-loathing. So my visit to Iowa's irony-free zone made me realize how sick my own trigger-happy, ironic impulses were making me. And in the aftermath of that trip, I turned to Epictetus, who reminded me to undergo disciplined introspection and a reorientation in the direction of virtue. I'm going on an irony-free diet. I invite any of you to. So I'm going to just kind of whiz through this last of, uh, affliction, which is elevating the tug of feelings over logos, clear thinking. Epictetus' tonic is to articulate your personal code and navigate life in accordance with it. So why do we need a code? And the Stoic answer is, of course, to save us from the idiocy of our feelings. So many people and traditions extol the idea of listening to our feelings as a guide to our behavior. I mean, isn't it just better for us all just to love one another or feel compassion? Well, when I was young, I sampled many different spiritual traditions and I learned to meditate, which I loved and I still do. When I meditated, I felt welcome feelings of peace and compassion. Great. But I bet you know what's coming. As tranquil as I felt, as at one with everyone I felt, those feelings didn't make me do anything nor did they compel me to refrain from doing self-serving or foolish things. Ecstatic feelings or feelings of at-oneness are swell, but they don't in and of themselves lead to right action, and nor do they prevent us from taking immoral action. During the Holocaust, some Nazi prison guards wept as they mowed down women and children but they still mowed down women and children. Feeling compassion for others can point toward right action, but it doesn't help when doing the right thing comes at personal cost. Who hasn't felt that pang? You know, you see the homeless fellow across the street, but do we cross the street to talk to him or give him money? Maybe sometimes. Epictetus repeatedly cautions us Feelings, even transcendent ones, fall short at best and can misguide. Existential philosopher Martin Buber, who had been an ardent student of mysticism, was once visited by a young troubled student. And this was when Buber happened to be in the throes of feelings of mystical ec ecstasy. Because Buber was full of his private feelings of divine illumination, he was blind to recognizing the student's need, born of pain and confusion. Buber later learned that the student committed suicide. And from that time forward, Buber swore off the pursuit of rapture 
and espouse the value of reason, or excuse me, of a reason and code-driven life. A code, as Epictetus would say, ensures we don't depend on the vagaries of feeling or merely improvised ad hoc self-styled virtue. Okay, I'm going to truncate this a little bit because we're getting towards uh, lunchtime. And I'll just bring us into my conclusion. Epictetus and his fellow Sto Stoics wildly differed from one another, but they spoke as one emphatic voice in pointing out the true enemy of the best possible life. What might be called living with a shrug. Barreling through one's moments, powered by half decisions, willy-nilly. Because of course, blatantly calculated evil is usually unmistakably identifiable and therefore uprootable. But the more commonplace mediocrities of thought, word, and deed are really what undo a life, what can undo our lives by destabilizing our ideals and in the aggregate, ultimately poisoning our collective, moral, aesthetic, practical, and civic life. This pervasive stinginess of spirit, which routinely passes itself off as plausible, acceptable, even welcome social behavior, not only insidiously poisons individual lives, but quietly degrades the social ecology. And so, Epictetus exhorts us to the discipline and self-awareness that staves off that dangerous shrug. Stoics advise that the opposite of putting logos at the center of our lives or purpose, telos, is gradual, gradual, mind you, drip by drip, gradual, drift from our ideals in all of its guises. Postponement, purposeful living, spiritual aloofness, not committing, half measures, trivializing, or altogether ignoring what's truly important. <clears throat> Through culturing ourselves, we fortify our character, our choices, and our commitment to the best possible life. And our work within ourselves, in turn, upgrades the quality of life for all whom we encounter. Epictetus summons us away from the insidious shrug to a life of earnest meaning making. He reminds us that the flourishing life is our birthright, but we gotta speak up for it and act in its behalf. The flourishing life must be insisted upon, earned, fought for. And we do this by deciding in an, in an apparently indifferent world that our own small life and what we do with it matters. And we act accordingly. So shame is sent packing. Logos is made welcome and meaning can make a home in us. So now I'm gonna close with an answer to, sometimes people will say, well, you know, what'd you learn from Epictetus? Or, you know, like that idea of on, you know, on one foot, uh, what have you learned from Stoicism? And I'll tell you, I'll show you. This one brief moment is everything.
everything. This one brief moment is everything. Everything. This one brief moment is everything. Thank you.